He is the host of America's Newsroom. He was an anchor at CNN uh-huh. for 10 years, and he has been at the Fox News Channel for about... 18. Help me 19, with my math, Bill. 19. 18, 19, 19 yeah. years. It is Bill Himmer. What's up, man? I'm great, brother. It was nice to be with you at the Super Bowl. Um, you know, we, um, we had to do it, Will. I mean, they, they need somebody to go and cover it, so we raised our hands. You know what I was a little struck we, by, actually? You didn't like the stadium. And I left Las Vegas going, man, what a town that is. And I'm not a big fan of Las Vegas to begin with. I mean, I'm pretty much 48 hours and out. I don't gamble much. I play a little blackjack here and there. But, like, the slots, you can have them. Uh, don't, I got no time for them. And you, you didn't like the stadium. I was like, I didn't. What, what, and was, I saw, what, was, what was up with that? I know it sounds, I know it sounds spoiled, and I, I don't. But I, but I also just have to be real. I just, you know, a stadium that is a year old, you know, had nothing interesting in the way <laughs> of food. It looked unfinished. The hallways mm-hmm. were tight. And there was a nine-holer at the bathroom. And I just think maybe <laughs> yeah. I'm spoiled because I live in Dallas and I have AT&T, which, by the way, is 20 years old. But I just think if you build a stadium in 2022, you ought to be up to at least the standard. Maybe you don't have to be SoFi. Maybe you don't have to be AT&T. But yeah. You should probably make a top five list of best stadiums if you're just a year or two old. Yeah, there. My, my only contribution would be I, I, th- I honestly agree with you on the potty parody thing. That, that was way out of control. Um, you, you could <laughs> not was. find a short line anywhere I, I guess, at any particular time in the game. It just wasn't there. And, and I'll tell you something. I found myself in line to take a leak with Titus O'Neill, WWE star, uh-huh. giant of a man. And we were both craning our neck around the corner to see some small screen television in the hallway because, of course, there was action during yeah. the Super Bowl. I think another thing you should do is you should have a television set in the bathroom. Thousand like, percent. If there's going to be a line, we need to be able to see the game yeah. ongoing while we're at the urinal. Agreed. Fair point. Yeah. Well, sorry, Allegiant Stadium. But I am here today with Bill Himmer. Bill, I want to get into some things outside the news cycle, but let's start today with something that happened on your show that happened on America's Newsroom. You had on Nikki Haley after her special announcement yesterday, which amounted to not much of an announcement that she's just going to remain in the race. But you asked her, you said, why? What are you waiting around for in this race? Let's listen to Nikki Haley. You do see yourself as an insurance policy depending on how these court cases turn I, out. I very much see myself as a Republican option that people can realize when you see Donald Trump can't win and you know that we have to turn this country around, then I am your alternative. That's what I've always tried to say is, look, let's get somebody who can win. When I defeat Biden by double digits, when I win swing states over Biden, that's how you win a general election. You don't win a general election sitting in a courtroom. You don't win a general election where you're taking the side of Putin over our allies who stood next to us at 9-11. Bill, I think the answer was yes. I agree. She sees herself as an insurance policy. Yeah. yeah. I, I, she did a long interview with the Associated Press, and, and the quote she gave was, um, uh, by the way, if you look at any of these contests so far, you've had three states— She's won two counties. I, I, I don't know how Saturday night goes. It's her home state. Um, Marco Rubio won two counties in 2016. Granted, there were six contenders back then. Now you've got two. Um, it, it's, it's a binary choice. It's Haley or Trump. Uh, does she win any of the 46? I don't know. But here, here's was her quote. Instead of asking me what states I'm going to win, because that's, that, that's eventually where you lead on this conversation. It's after South Carolina and past Michigan at Super Tuesday. So throw a dart, pick a spot on the map, and tell us where you're going to win. And I I knew she would not go there because of this quote. Instead of asking me what states I'm going to win, why don't we ask how he's going to win a general election after spending a full year in a courtroom? That was where the question came from. Then later in the interview, she said, how in the world do you win a general election when these cases keep coming uh, and going and the judgments keep coming? And I, my, my point on that was there is evidence based on polling that the more time Trump spends in a courtroom, the better his numbers get. Now, I don't know if that changes with a conviction. Maybe it does. 
Uh, some of the polling suggests that. But I, I think I think before we answer that, Will, we have to wait and see if and when it happens, and then we'll see how the public responds. Well, your question's well positioned because there isn't a path for Nikki Haley to become the nominee for president through the electoral process. She doesn't have a, a state, much less, as you point out, even a county that she can count on to nominate her as the Republican candidate for president. So you say, why? Why do you stick around through an embarrassment through your home state of South Carolina? Why do you stick around for Super Tuesday? And the answer has to be there in your question. I'm waiting for Donald Trump mm-hmm. to lose in a courtroom. Yeah. And then that somehow makes me the nominee for president. Yeah, I guess the next time it comes up, and I think it will come up, because what she has said this week is that she's staying in through Super Tuesday. Now, the Trump team thinks they're going to lock up the nomination by March 19th, which is two Tuesdays after uh, uh, March 5th, Super Tuesday. And if that's the case, you know, they're they're on a glide path. But I think if the question comes up again, we try and figure out, is that a yes or a no? You know, is is it the insurance policy? And I I agree with your observation that based on her answer, I think the I think we already know what it is. It's yes. So I mentioned, Bill, that I want to. Uh, talk to you about some things outside of the news cycle. We mm-hmm. we did get to hang out together two weeks ago. You did appear here on the Will Cain Show. We talked about the Super Bowl. But, you know, one of my goals here on the Will Cain Show is not just for me, but for the audience to have a little bit more time to get to know the people they see every day on Fox News. And as I'm learning more about you, you've been a guy who has been in front of the camera for a long time now, Bill. But you've also really taking it as, a, I would assume, a point of pride, that you're also out in the field telling stories. And I just looked at your resume. It's not just Super Bowls. It's Iraq. It's Afghanistan. It's Sandy Hook. It's Pennsylvania mine workers. But one of the stories that stuck out to me on your resume, on your list of experiences, Bill, is that you were there when Timothy McVeigh was put to death. And it just kind of stuck out to me because I wonder what that experience was like. I don't know, were you... How, were no, you in the I was, room? I was Have not you in ever the room. been? No. There, there was a very I short with that Yeah, a very short number of people they took in. Uh and I was not one selected. Uh that was Terre Haute, Indiana, um, after a horrific story in Oklahoma City. But continue with your question. Well, that that one stuck out to me because I was immediately curious about. I wonder what Bill saw. I wonder what he felt. I wonder what he came away from that. Maybe even how he was changed from that story. But I don't want to box you into just that story. You having been to so many places, I'm just curious, you know, you're still in front of the camera, but you spend a lot of time, you know, burying yourself, getting to know some place, some people, some story. What is the one that that kind of changes Bill Hammer? Wow. uh, Great question. Thank you. Um, If you'll allow me, look, I had 10 great years at CNN, really phenomenal years. I mean, I really fought hard to get outside out the door, uh, which wasn't easy to do. You know, you're young and you're trying to lay an impression on your bosses and you're trying to get them ultimately to trust you. And after banging on the doors for so many years, they finally dispatched me to the Aviano Air Base in Italy because there was an air war over Kosovo at the time. Bill Clinton, then president, agreed to allow NATO flights to fly no lower than th- – think, think, think about how war has changed in your life. Think about this. We come out of Vietnam in the mid-'70s. America is scarred for a long time. In the early 1990s, there were troops sent into Somalia, and um, they had a rough time. And there was a helicopter that was shot out of the sky, and then again we start to feel, hey, man, we can't lose anybody. And this continued for some time. And so the air war was ordered at 15,000 feet, no less, over Kosovo. And while wow, you think about that, Will, what, what, what's happened since then? What, what's changed since then? Why, why and what explains why the politicians were so reticent when it came to casualties? I'm talking injuries, the wounded. We, we stayed away from that, I would argue, for decades. And the thing that popped really was 9-11. And the whole country was just balls in on it. You know, let's go. Let's rebuild our military. Let's learn, learn how to fight. And uh, let's, let's settle the score. 
And I think about how things changed during Afghanistan, then the war in Iraq, and then we became suddenly the, the fighting force that we're capable of, and that's the United States military, which continues to refine itself and invent things that the private sector could only dream about doing, and the sacrifice by so many men and women. And I, I just think about like that process for how we went from my first assignment overseas with CNN you know, through Afghanistan and through Pakistan and through the Middle East time and time again as to where we are now. And it's all changed. Um, we're back in a place where we should be as the world's leading superpower. And for me to see that evolution, it really, it, it just leaves an impression on me in a way where I, I, I've seen it happen I've seen the way it changes lives. I've seen the sacrifice that's gone into it. And, and it's hard not, not to walk away being so impressed with that. And I'll tease you one assignment. I got a good one coming up here in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because I don't want to talk about it until it happens. I don't want to jinx this no hitter, okay? But it's a doozy and I can't wait. It's a real adventure. But when I reflect about, you know, the last, you know, 10 years at CNN, 18, 19 at Fox, you know, we're coming up in 30 years. And 9-11 is hard to escape. You cannot have this conversation, Will, based on your question without thinking about 9-11. Um, but there are a couple other things that really um, – I like to think that reporters are good when they have thick skin and broad shoulders and keep the story like a Heisman Trophy, you know, that far from your head and your heart. And the reason you want to keep it away from your heart is because you want your head to think especially when, when things are popping, and not to be overcome by the emotion. I think a lot of people are very good at that. I think I learned how to, get good, uh, to be good at that. But between 9-11 and there was, there, there was an earthquake in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and we went flying in there. And by the way, this is on the island of Hispaniola, and the east side is the Dominican Republic, fully developed, and the west is, is Haiti, which has been tortured by their governments for decades. Billions and billions of U.S. and American dollars and international dollars have gone into that government, and they just squandered all of it. And the net result is what you see in the streets in the town every day, and that's a third-world country that isn't too far, just a short plane ride for the United States of America. But their political leaders have squandered their opportunities time and again. So you fly in that environment, number one, and number two, you've got this horrendous earthquake. And you're thinking, you're asking, like, what did they do? You know, what, what, from the heavens above, how did this happen to you people? And it, it, really, it really gets you. And the other story was Sandy Hook. Um, we went up. Th there was a bulletin that crossed on the AP. I think it was 930 in the morning. It might have been 830. But what you don't want with a school shooting or any shooting is one line of information and then dead silence for hours because uh, that's a telltale sign. So we knew it was an elementary school. We knew it was Sandy Hook. We had no information for hours. And then it started to dribble in a little more and a little more and talked to the boss. He said, you want to go up? And I said, I'll be there. And I tell you what, Will, it's, it's a long story. I'll, I'll truncate it for the purpose of our conversation here. If you were to walk through the parking lot of Sandy Hook Elementary, it was the, as close as I have ever been to smelling the devil. And I, I could feel it. I knew it was there. It was satanic in nature and really took me back. And remember, this is mid-December. And I remember walking over the camera when I got back to the camera location. I said, just remember, you know, these are five- and six-year-old kids. And for most of them, their parents already have Christmas presents wrapped for them that they will never open and we hung out there for a long time. On that Saturday afternoon, the coroner came out and gave a press conference. And I want to relay the story to you quickly because I want you to hear it. The, the coroners are people of, of, they're of a different breed. Their training, what they do for a living, how they explain it to others. They gave a press conference in the middle of Saturday afternoon. It was mid-December again, and America was living its life. And if you're a reporter on these stories, you have to pay attention to the detail. And if you don't pay attention to the detail, you're going to miss things. For any story, whether you're working the Hill or whether you're at Sandy Hook. And we, we had to listen to, you know, these little five- and six-year-old bodies 
the way he described these bullets going through their flesh. And, man, I, it, it just it takes your breath away. And I, I would say those three stories are what I, I seem to come back to. And I come back to them not because of what you learned or what you saw, but because of what you felt. And that's, mm. that's what did it for me. You know, Bill, we, we had Tony Robbins here on the Will Cain Show last week, and he said, um, we live in a world full of information, You're, you're an onslaught of information, but information without emotion is not retained. Um, he said it's one of the reasons women have such long memories as compared to men, but <laughs> I appreciate— He may not be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I appreciate— uh, I appreciate you talking about how you felt about those stories, and that's the balance of your job, our job— I like the Heisman Trophy analogy, is to hold the story. You can't ignore your heart. You have to feel, and you have to, mm -hmm. to relay that emotion to an audience, but you also have to analyze it with your head, so you have to hold it out like the Heisman pose. I appreciate yeah. that. One of the things um, about your, your bio, Bill, that stands out to me is on this same on this, this same subject. It's an interest in always getting out, out of the studio, out, I don't know, out of the norm, you know, I saw you, like me, love sports. You always mm -hmm. have. You started out doing sports. But then you took this, I think you were 26 years old. You took this hiatus. You backpacked yeah. all over the world. But you, you also made it part of your job, filing dispatches back to your local media. Um, why? Why go hit, wow. I, uh, what was it, Southeast Asia? Yeah. Middle East? <laughs> yeah. The um, I'm older than you, so so bear with me here. This was the early 90s. This is right before email, and this is right before ATMs. Okay, think about that. You're traveling with books, Will, literally. Um, <clears throat> I had my midlife crisis at age 26, and I felt if I did not circumnavigate the globe with a backpack, all third world travel now. You know, this wasn't like Paris and London and Amsterdam. You know, this, was, uh, this, this had some grit to it. And I thought, if I don't get this done by the time I'm 30, you know, my life means nothing. <laughs> and I don't know why I felt that, but I, I guess it was a sense of adventure. And uh, maybe for me, it was um, a pursuit of an education that I felt at that point in my life I had not yet acquired. And I, I can tell you, you know, listen, these were emerging. These were third world countries before they became emerging markets, before they became competitors with the United States. We're talking China. Um, we're talking India, uh, Vietnam, uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Middle East, Eastern Europe, Russia, gone for 10 months. And every day you wake up, you do something that you have never done before in your life. And I, it, it's the fullest education that I can imagine. When you are, when you're being a good reporter, when you are out understanding the story, face to face with people who have experienced it, you, you learn about it in a whole different way rather than just sitting at a desk. No, not, that, not there's anything wrong with a desk. The advantage of being an anchor every day is that on those stories where you are not out there, you at least get a voice on some of the biggest stories of the day for that particular day. And so what this trip did for me is it gave me an education that I would have never, not, never gotten uh, without it. Um, were, you, were you Bill alone? Yeah, for the most part. I left with a buddy, buddy of mine, and we traveled for a couple months, and he split. Um, and I um, sort of blazed the trail. Wow. I tell you, you know what, Will, is really interesting? You know, there's no travel guide on this. You know, you're, you're at a train station somewhere in, in Varanasi, India, and you're trying to figure out how to get to Delhi. Well, <laughs> you got to figure out the writing on the wall, right? And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and the same thing is true for China. You know, I, I would take a 37-hour train ride from uh, maybe from Guangzhou up to Beijing before they had the high-speed rail, 17-hour train ride to Shanghai, take another, I don't know, 18-hour train ride to Guilin, hop on a boat, take a ferry here, there. And it worked. It freaking worked, <laughs> right? You didn't, need a yeah. you didn't need a phone. And there was you this didn't great have a lonely planet? I did, yeah. That's that's that, that that was your Bible. that's the old school yeah that's the old school iPhone Lonely Planet <laughs> book that you carried everywhere with you. They gave you, you know a, what's interesting about they so, gave you a ho couple the, hotel recommendations and maybe a few things to sightsee and then you were on your own. Hey, I think I had my midlife crisis is about the same age. I think it's a quarter life crisis or maybe a third life crisis. Um, 
you know, after law school, Bill, I moved to Montana. I worked a ranch. Uh-huh. I, I worked for a hunting outfitter. I spent a year, not necessarily in part in the mountains, but but in part in the valleys. So some semblance of civilization as well. And I didn't do what you did. And I wonder, as I you've used the word education, and I don't, from what I understand, you didn't leave your idea of a career behind. You filed those dispatches. So yeah, I right wonder, that. was that was that the purpose, education, or was it? I'm gonna be honest. Part of mine, I had some sense of what I wanted to do, but it was also to be that. Honestly, I, I know it's cliche, but I was doing the thing where I'm like, I want to find myself. I want to, I want to know what it is I want to do and why mm-hmm. I'm here. And, and that happened for me same time at about the age of 25. Yeah. Yeah, I can fully understand that and fully respect that, too. Um, It's part of the necessary process of growing up, right? Um, Maturing and finding out what's what's life in it for you. Um, I guess for me, I I, look, I I put so much blood, sweat and tears into my job. I didn't want to just kick it to the curb. I didn't want to think that if I if I if I do this and I catch malaria in three months, I'm going to come home without a gig. And um, I, I enjoyed the challenge of television. I liked the challenge of live. I, I like meeting deadlines. And I like, you know, poking around and learning things. And so I didn't want to totally give that up. And that's why I kept the connection up. And it, 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 look, it, it, wor- it worked out my favor in a, in a big way. And, you know, Will, I, w- I would say this. I don't know what your Montana experience led you to. And I don't know what Tony Robbins said was the moment in his life where he said, I got to pursue this. And once I get to the end of this experience, I'll be able to do X, Y, and Z. I really didn't know what it would do for me. Um, but I know how it ended up. And I had no way of seeing that. And I, I just feel like with that opportunity, I was able to walk into CNN and do an audition and write down all these countries that I had been on my own, and that's what they were looking for. And I was 30 years old, and they were in desperate need of it. I kind of walked into an awesome opportunity, and I've I, I've never looked back. And I, I don't, I just feel so fortunate, you know. I mean, I, I get to engage people with like like you. Uh, and others who have all original thoughts on their own, and you you want to get involved intellectually and sort of understand things on your terms um, after you've done the work, and you come at it from an educated perspective. And boy, I just look at, uh, look at the people here at Fox, and it, it's such a pleasure to just pick the brains of really smart people. That's that's, that's it's a, honestly my favorite it's a real thing. Gift. To- well, it's a, my favorite thing about my job is that I get I get to I get paid to continue to learn, and I know that sounds hokey, but I'm a I'm a curious person by nature. Mm-hmm. I'd be doing this if I wasn't getting paid, you know. And now I get to learn. I get to fall down the rabbit hole of whatever it is I want to learn about, and try to add something of value to the consumer of current events. Hey, um, oh. I want to talk career. So, mm-hmm. ten years at CNN, you moved to Fox. Now, at the time you moved to Fox, Bill, it's no longer necessarily a startup. It's no longer the – it's still rebellious in the news ecosystem. But I'd, I'd say, you know, it's it's more it's, – it's probably fair to say it's more established. You come over in like 05, No doubt. 06, Thousand percent. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and But I'm curious, not just the why of why you moved from CNN to Fox, but how. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he, he was an – I never got to know the man, but he's, I mean, he's a titan in the news media world, Roger Ailes, and I'm sure he had something to do with bringing you over to Fox. Just give me that story, how you make the move from CNN um, to Fox. He's from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. Uh, You know, you're from Texas, right? I mean, when you hear about people from your home state, you pay a little more attention to them. And I paid attention to him. Um, What I noticed during the election recount of 2000, which was another phenomenal story, Will. You would have loved it, especially with your law background. <clears throat> so we went 37 days without a president. And I'm, I remember the night before because Bernie Shaw and Judy Woodruff were our political anchors in Atlanta. And my job was to take over for them at midnight. And I was all jacked up for that because there are going to be some late House seats that are going to break on the West Coast. Some Senate seats are going to be decided. So maybe we get a chance to call the balance of power, even though the presidency will be over. Well, they never got off the, the anchor desk. So <laughs> I never got on. And the next day, this producer, Jody Fleissig, came up and said, Hammer, can you get the Tallahassee? 
I said, Jody, this thing's going to be over at 5 o'clock. And she said, can you get the Tallahassee? I said, sure. So I was one of the first ones in. I was the very last one to leave, 37 days in Tallahassee. And, wow, you want to talk about an education, Will? What I noticed during that period, and it was a Sunday night, and Catherine Harris was certifying the votes. This is northern Florida. It's November. It's December. It's chilly. There's a mist in the air. It was around the, the main area of their state government. And we're over there, and we've got like 10 people holding signs behind us, and they're well-behaved. And then across the uh, plaza, red brick everywhere in Tallahassee in this location, there's people screaming and yelling. And I asked my producer, I said, can you get over there and see what's going on? They came back. They said, it's Fox. I said, yeah, what's happening? They said, they're cheering for Bill O'Reilly. I said, oh, and what else? And they're cheering for Sean Hannity, and they're cheering for Shepard Smith. And I was looking at the ratings every day, and I could see what was happening in real time. And a lot of people think that Fox overtook CNN in 2001 during 9-11. It was actually the year prior um, when they really started to make a move. And I just thought, you know, they've got such a tremendous lineup. And I'd been at CNN for 10 years. I felt it was time for a change. And I thought if I could crack that lineup, I think it would be a really good move for me. Stay in New York City. Get a different experience under my belt. And I just, what Fox wants you to do is they want you to lean into your personality. A lot of other shops are well-produced, right? They're produced, you've got a rundown, you're going to do this story and this story and that story. What they want to do at Fox is rip the whole rundown up. And when you do that, you create more of a human moment. And I think if you look across the board at our lineup, that's what you get. And I was always drawn to that, and it was, that was a big attraction to me. Well, I, I still, and we have a couple minutes left together. Uh, yeah. I still want to hear the how. So I'm going to say this to you, Bill. Like, um, I think the hows are interesting. And mm-hmm. By the way, the how of how I came from ESPN to Fox is interesting, and it's not a story that I've told, and I don't know when or how I will tell that story. The how of how I joined ESPN is not interesting because it is, a, it is an agent-driven exercise where they see a need and they contact ESPN, and then we have re- uh, meetings and relationships are established. The how of how I got to CNN and broke into this business is interesting because I sent an email to John Klein, then the president of CNN, oh, one yeah, night. Right on. I guessed it is I I guessed it is email address, Bill. I knew uh-huh. it was first name dot last name at <laughs> Turner dot com at the time. You're right. And I sent him an email and he respond he responded within fifteen minutes and said, I think we should talk. And and that's what got me started. So I'm just curious, yeah. was the how for you from CNN to Fox? Is it the standard old oh my agent called their agent, you know, or or was it I you think that- you sent the how for, and message or he reached no, out to you. The how for me was that I'm 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 going to pack up here and I had a few opportunities and this one came up and I quite literally met with Roger at an Italian restaurant and we sat there for 3 hours. And I, you know it's 10 10 o'clock at night. It was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday. I was like <laughs> you know, I'm sure you got to work tomorrow. Um and I, th- I think that's when the, you know, the connection was made. And I liked him from the first moment he said hello. Um, I liked how frank he was. Um, I kind of liked his attitude. You know, he, he, w- he was, look, Roger at the end of his life got, uh, we all know about the reputation toward the end of his life. And um, what people who have not met him may not understand is that he was just a flat-out funny cat. And he, he would walk into, you know, we, we, we used to have a boardroom on the second floor, and we'd all be gathered there on election nights. And, you know, there's a moment of tension in the room. We really don't know what's going to happen here. And he would just come in with an anecdote and crack everybody up. And it was, it was always so pitch perfect. I'll give one anecdote from what I remember, what I like to share with other people. I was coming up for a contract renewal. So I, I got all my arguments together and I wrote them down on a piece of paper. I got ready for my big meeting with Roger. And I walked in there and I spread out my papers. And he goes, <clears throat> before we get started, he said, are you generally happy? I said, generally. I said, generally? Yes. He said, good, because I got a thousand people on the other side of the door and they want to kill me because they hate me. And if I know that I don't need to worry about you, that's one less person in this building. So what else you got? (laughs) I was like, meeting over. 
Also a visionary. Last question for Bill yes, Himmer. Um, everybody's fascinated by, uh, I know I am, your day. I find it fascinating that Brian Kilmeade has to wake up at 2.30 a.m. and work seemingly until 10 o'clock <laughs> at night. It's ridiculous. Uh, you host a show from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, what is your schedule like? What time do you wake up? 4.45. 4.45. 4.45. In the building at what time? Uh, 6.23. Okay. For a 9 o'clock. So that's a lot of hair and makeup for you, uh, Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> we do a conference call at 6.45 with Dana and Charlie, our executive producer. And then uh, we're done. If we're on that phone call at 7.10, we've gone too long. And then it's really uh, how much can you read, how fast... Um, right. How much can you get your? How quickly can you get your segments together? And then we grip it and rip it and go. And then you're done, and you hit yoga and spin spin <laughs> class right after. <laughs> I wish. I mean, I do like hot yoga. I will not lie. I know. It's, I, it's, I know well, you do some it, exercises. It centers me. Man. It just <laughs> keeps me balanced. So if I get a chance to get there twice a week, it's a really great week. If I get there once a week, I feel lucky. All right. Keep him centered. Bill Himmer, the host of America's New Room, Newsroom, right here on the Will Kane Show. Awesome man. I could go okay. for another half hour with you. I love getting to know you. Thank you for doing this today you here got on the it, Will Kane Show. Uh, good to be with you, Will. See you real soon in person, okay? Take care, Bill.